Well, speaking of high low, uh huh. I I dated a football player in college who was like on ESPN, and I was kind of just like always supporting him. And I was a tennis player; like mm-hmm. I had my own career in college, but it was kind. Of, he was he was important. We broke up because we had very different views on life. And then Lo, I fucked the mascot. Oh wow! And Wait, he, in, while in the mascot suit. Yeah. Hey everybody! <laughs> so cute and cozy. <laughs> it's like a little library chat. Um, this is our first live recording we've done for High Low with Emrata, so this is um, a big deal. And um, I'm gonna do a little intro now for our fabulous guest, Hannah Burner, who, um, aka, is known as some comedian girl. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but I had the pleasure of seeing her stand up. Um, what was that? Two weeks ago? Yeah. And I was like, this is the perfect guest. Um, You're too sweet. Hannah is an amazing comedian. Um, She's in the hot seat today, but she normally puts other people in the hot seat, (laughs) which has made her um, a viral sensation on TikTok. It's how I got to know her. Who should tell the story of how we met first? You can start. Okay. Look at us. We go. Way I was. Back. I was doing. You know. We we have like a love story. I yeah. think at this point, right? I this is like you. our third date, or would you say second? It's like two and a half. Okay, two and a half. Because I felt like the internet connection almost qualified as a date. I, I just didn't know that you saw the internet connection because it was me just like having fun. Well, I got very stressed. Okay, so <laughs> I was on um, Julia Fox's podcast, mm-hmm. and we were talking about. The whole thing of paying for the bill. And she, you did this amazing TikTok where you asked people, do you reach for the purse or not? Like, do you even pretend to reach for the purse? Or do you, like, just wait for the guy, whatever? And so I was bringing it up, and I was like, some comedian girl on TikTok. Well, this comedian girl saw that, and she was like, uh, excuse me, that's me. <laughs> so my DMs started to blow up, and people were like, Emily's talking about you. Emily's talking about you. And you and Julia are kind of cultural icons in the girly pop community and beyond. So I immediately was flattered, um, so honored. And I showed my husband and he was like, you have to make a video in response. So I was like, I am some comedian girl. But also like my whole life, I've wanted to be known as a comedian. So it really meant I did something right. As just like that bitch. Okay. Word. (laughs) Well, you've made it to some comedian bitch. Yeah. But... the fact that then you saw my response video, mm-hmm. I didn't really know if she saw, but a couple of my friends saw and that was enough. They were like, that's really cool that she mentioned you. And there was a rumor that Emily might come to my comedy show. Yes. This is the first date, really. This is the first date. Yeah. <laughs> Picked out my outfit. Are we m- going to make out today? I think we will probably by the end of this. This is going to get weird. Yeah. So mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody's like, whoa, buckle up. <laughs> So people have told me that certain people would come to my comedy shows, but they've always been like busy. I just wasn't going to make a big thing out of mm-hmm. it in my head. And you stroll in just like so casual with your bestie mm-hmm. from like high school, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and we just start chatty Cathying. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, I'm like, some model girl came to my show mm-hmm. and she's a vibe. And you stayed for the whole show. Do people normally leave? Early? I don't know. You said, <laughs> you're like, if it was a wow, that was, it, not only did she come, she also <laughs> stayed. <laughs> she supports other women in the arts, we like to say. I do. I do. I also was loving my beer. You got, y'all were funny as well, I have to say. You're funny. You're funny. You're funny, bitch. It is funny. I noticed she followed me at the end of the show. So I was like, she waited. Mm-hmm. She liked the content. It's and true. And she was like, respect. <laughs> well, we were talking about live shows because I was telling you that I have um, a issue, a mental health issue where mm-hmm. I think I would be good at stand-up comedy, which is like... <laughs> it's a sickness. It's an actual sickness. I am seeking help. Um, <laughs> but after watching you, I especially... I was like having a bad episode because I was like, oh, she made that look so easy and great and natural. She also picks on people in the audience. So like, you know, she's really good it's because she's men. on her toes. I You're like, come for the men. You yeah. really do come for the men. I actually wanted to talk to you about that. <laughs> Girl, I've been training my whole life for this moment. I feel like you really... Um, I mean, not to, I hate when, you know, I feel like the girlies want to like not talk about men and then it's like the first thing we do. (laughs) We're like, how do we, how do we talk about men less? How are you planning on talking about men less? Well, we have to 
be honest, men are such a big part of our lives. Mm. And the same extent that we might like hate them, we also love them. They are our biggest predators, but they're also like bring us so much joy. So it's a thin line and it stresses us the fuck out. Between love and hate. I was saying this the other day. Someone was like, you clearly like don't hate men. You're out in these streets dating. And I was like, thank you. You're trying so hard to date women and no one's letting you. Any volunteers? Like, is there anyone? Wanted, the I've been, I'm really wanted. trying. I'm like, hello, like, where, where are the girlies at? But it's okay. I also was thinking, <laughs> tell me if I'm going too ahead, but like the concept of high-low mm. made me really think about men. Oh, okay. Wow, she came with a bet. <laughs> Girly, <laughs> I was referring in the Uber. I was like, I'm like, okay, she happen. did her scared. research. She has the cards. She I has did, them. I did some research, but I realized like, High low men is such a real thing. Okay, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> well, I feel like high, like I've wanted to date guys who maybe are like wealthy or guys who are really um successful family money mm-hmm. and they obviously have their demons. And then you date like the open mic comic who still lives with his parents. They're in mm-hmm. Connecticut, so that's a plus. You don't know if it's like a nice neighbor in Connecticut or not. But anyway, regardless, it's like <laughs> You learn that what is high, what is low in terms of people, and what you think like quality is on paper is not always what brings you joy. Snaps, honestly. It's really crazy. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot because like Gen Z, our favorite generation. I identify Mm -hmm. as a Gen Z. I do as well. And that was honestly one of the things I was like, great. So we're the ladies who pretend like we're like those. That's our demographic. We're like we were born at the wrong time. time. It's like five years too early. (laughs) Like it's confusing. But I feel like Gen Z's really decenter men from their life. Yeah, they do. Because but mm. they're always talking about, like, get the bag, girls, because, like, men are never going to give you anything. So you got to just, like, at least secure the bag, get the dinner, get the blah, 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 whatever. And I'm like, I don't know, because I'm out here in my 30s and I'm watching mm-hmm. my friends who married for money mm-hmm. regret it. <gasps> regret it because, you know what? First of all, the economy is bad. So these men are losing <laughs> their money. So the money, you just can't rely Those on the money. Those crypto kings, they're no, shaking. crypto kings, but also, honey, even the stock market, like, they are True. shaking in their boots. My best friend Paige's mom, mm-hmm. to give credit, her favorite quote was, if you marry for money, you will work for the rest of your life. Oof. How powerful is that? Mm. But I learned at a young age that like, I always say that I joked about Disney teaches you that you should be attracted to the prince. You're like, actually, did you take notes during my set? Because if that was a part of it. <laughs> Disney. Did you connect with I am. it? I did. I'm, Disney was less for me, but go ahead. I love it. But I feel part. like uh, as millennial women, we grew up with Disney. There was that prince. He's definitely a narcissist mm. and takes up all the air in the room and you think that's the guy that makes you feel successful to get the prince that was like the story of every single movie and then when you get the prince sometimes you're like wait but he doesn't see me I don't feel fulfilled I'm not happy he's kind of a duke Mm -hmm. and learning that the right man for you is not what society thinks is right but it's who makes you feel seen and who makes you feel lit up and light and yourself I once watched a documentary about um, Dr. Dre Okay, (laughs) segue. (laughs) Just follow me. Mm -hmm. And his wife, they're now divorced, said like, I'm his rock and he's the balloon. And I love that for them. But I remember thinking like, I'm not a fucking pebble to someone. And I want someone to be a gardener and I'm a flower and vice versa. So just because he's hot and rich does not mean happiness. So for that, for you, that translated to old. Yes. I like I'm tired. I'm with an older tired man. (laughs) (laughs) Um, your husband yes. is how much older than you? So he's 47. Okay. I'm, so we're like 15 years gap. Okay. Tell us the secrets. We all need a zaddy, I guess. Is that I, the... I always say just go to Walgreens and hang out in the Advil section. Mm-hmm. They, their lower backs are killing them. Um, I think I, Amy Schumer does a bit where she's like, they're just so tired. <laughs> and you get them at the end when they're just so tired. They like, literally can't cheat on you. No, they, they can't literally can't do anything. They li- they're they so tired. And they're just like, I just really like, I just want to go to sleep. When and then you just you back, get them. <laughs> they're napping. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, Amy Schumer does have a good bit where you're just like, shh, it's okay. But I do think there's something to be said about in his 30s, he was like really chasing his career and really busy. And he had a, has a great career of comedy in Ireland. And then during COVID, we met and... He slid into your DMs, right? He slid into my DMs, but I saw him at the cellar like five years previously. Did you think he was funny? I thought he was so cute, Thank so God. funny. Imagine if you hadn't. I know. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't be married. But I remember that like he lives in Ireland. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I'll never marry that man. Right. But guys, don't 
don't let manifestations get wrong because mm. anything can happen. <laughs> so he, because of COVID, moved back and I was in Long Island. He was in Long Island. But there was something about a guy who like I really, <laughs> this sounds so bad, but I respected his brain and how it worked. Wow, that's shocking. And that was new for me. <laughs> I know that's, I mean, I'm saying like, well, wow, <laughs> holy shit, you do have something special. <laughs> no, but I kind of had that mentality where I like to feel like I was the dude who had mm. like male models around her. Like I just wanted to, I wanted to be the hot one. You were like, no, no. I'm the balloon and they're the pebble. Exactly. Uh-huh. But I wanted, actually, I wanted to be the ugly one. I want them to be hot. And I wanted to show that like I could be the breadwinner and I could just have like hot guys around me all the time and I don't care about them. But that was me having some like intimacy issues because I didn't want to be up for like someone could actually reject me who's an equal Mm -hmm. oh I loved a like (laughs) a dumb athlete really yes what kind of athletes well speaking of high low Uh uh-huh the name of the pod I thank you so much you're doing a great job (laughs) I'm like I'll I'll tip you later how many times can you say high low it's a great name I I dated a football player in college who was like on ESPN and I was kind of just like always supporting him. And I was a tennis player. Like mm-hmm. I had my own career in college, but it was kind of, he was, he was important. They treated the football guys well as they should. And he wanted me to go to Bible study and I couldn't, I just kept missing it. And then we broke up cause we had very different views on life. And then lo, I fucked the mascot. Oh, wow. And Wait, he, in, while in the mascot suit? No, okay. but he wanted Points to. Points are t- docked for <laughs> I that. I know. It Don- was a full furry moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it made me realize, like, he, the the mascot was so funny. And, like, yeah, people didn't think it was, like, cool that I was walking around with this guy who wore <laughs> a Bucky Badger suit all the time because I went to Wisconsin. <laughs> but it made me realize, like, wait, life is about finding what you want. Mm-hmm. And I don't. And I started to care less about what other people thought because in relationships— yeah, they might be impressed for a second, but you have to sleep with them at night. Oh, uh, you have to wake up with them in the morning, even oh, worse. Even yeah. worse. Even yeah. worse. Sleep you have to get be through. prepared for it all. Exactly. Um, well, you said in your comedy special, or maybe in a TikTok where you're like, yeah, the fact that I'm married is so off brand. It is. <laughs> people don't even know I'm married. <laughs> really? I feel like you like talk about it and represent it. How in long podcasts, have you guys been married? I do. It's like officially one year. This week. Oh, wow. Congrats. What are you guys going to do for your anniversary? I have two shows in Boston. Because <laughs> you're you're that damn balloon? She's, she's no, you both are your garden. Sorry, I've, I've yeah, lost the metaphor. There's a lot of metaphors and uh-huh. I got a little confused, but you get me. Yeah, yeah. You guys are watering each other and growing. Yeah, he's he's very supportive and I think he has his own confidence of who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not telling everyone to like date an older man. I do think sometimes there could be a power imbalance mm-hmm. if you're like too young or if you financially are completely dependent on him and we do yeah. not want the girlies to be in that situation. No. That's but what, I found that's someone the first le- me- message and lesson we're delivering from this podcast. Yes. It's like we do not need that. No. The girlies do not need that. And I'm I think in your early 20s I say dating is kind of like um researching Mm. don't take it as like result oriented like it didn't work out we're learning what we want how are you supposed to know in your early 20s and then in your late 20s you start realizing like oh that I can't deal with that I can't deal with that how old are you now I'm uh 31 I'm turning 32 um in early June so I've just started saying 32 Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, because it's a month away. It's like weeks <laughs> away. But my friends were like snapping. We were, I was just in Miami with my friends and they were like, you're not 32 yet. And I'm like, I'm fucking 32. You're mentally prepared Like I don't it. need, I was doing that. I was saying 30 before when I was 29. It's like a, it's a game. Why do you do that? Um, I mean, I actually don't mind being in my early 30s. Mm-hmm. I think it's more so I don't embarrass myself by going the wrong way later, <laughs> which I have done. Like, I have legit told people that I'm, like, younger than I am because I am that fried. But because Another of, illness. Because of gigs, do you ever up. feel like they're looking for a certain age? You know, I did at one point. I don't know if I'm just delusional or mm-hmm. just don't care anymore mm-hmm. um where I'm just like yeah I'm the age I am and like thank god for Botox and like <laughs> bangs and like we're gonna just carry on I you mean know? the fact that you're not only beautiful but then you pull off bangs is like a oh, double whammy that this all was the such girlies a are trying to handle I mean this so everybody knows bangs is like a divorce breakup thing and True. <laughs> I didn't do it right away I just want to say I didn't fucking do it right away okay <laughs> what I did instead was I got 
I would say 60 pounds of hair sewn into my head, which by the way, last week, one of my besties finally said to me, like, you know, you know, you looked crazy. Was right? your neck okay? No, no. <laughs> I had hair down to my butt and I was like, I'm a mermaid. Leia. I was like not able to eat. I was so upset for my breakup, but I had so much hair. So much hair. And then I had to take it off um, for like shows and stuff because it was September. It was like back to reality. So the weave had to come out and I was like, okay, well, I can't like look at myself in the mirror as the person I was before. So that's when the bangs came in and they've just gotten shorter and shorter. And you know what? It was not a mistake. And now my friends who were like, don't do it, don't do it are like, okay, you win. You're right. You were right about the bangs. I thought you kind of had the bangs to be a little incognito. Oh, no. And you kind of like open it up when you have to do a photo shoot. When I'm feeling like... "Mm." Yeah, like she wants to show herself to the world. Oh, now she's gone. Yeah, no, it's like, it's more like, am I cute today? Like, I'm like manic pixie dream girl, you know, vibes. And then other times it's like, I don't know. You can do a lot of things with them. It's a whole thing. Well, I um, would wake up and my bangs would just be like straight up. And I'd be like, Mm -hmm. this is me today. Um, Because you have to put a little effort into it. So I thought that, but it's actually a lot less work than I thought because I'm a lazy lazy hoe like when I especially when it comes to hair I'm just not good at it I'm not good at it like I'll be the person who like one part of the the front that I could see in the mirror like looks good and then the back is like jank and everyone's like so true why I had to get the hair taken out was because they're just developed like a nest of where I couldn't reach where I like literally wasn't brushing and it was just getting thicker and thicker and I was there it was bad I lost so much hair when I was getting them taken out I was like okay well this was a bad thing. I'm not the type of person who can maintain these things. Like, I shouldn't have nice things. The bangs, the best part about it is like, you can be in a mood and be like, I don't, I hate my face and whatever. And then you just like trim your bangs and you're like, I'm cute. You're a different person. And it makes me feel powerful and also gives a little thrill. So I'm really, I I, I'm like pro bangs. I would look like Chucky, the like horror doll. I don't even know if it has bangs, but I feel like it would. I had bangs, a joke about bangs in my hour. And I remember walking off stage because I was aware that Emily was there. And I was like, I just made fun of bangs. But it's also, there's so many worse things you could have done Mm -hmm. than gotten insane extensions. And I love that your friends were supportive until they weren't. I don't know. You should see pictures. (laughs) I don't know if there's that many things I could have done that were worse. Like, I'm trying to think what else. Like, I could have shaved my head, but like, I wouldn't have done that. Like, that's my money. Like, I'm, you know, I have a hair contract. Like, I'm not cutting my hair. That would have been the moment, though. No, it wouldn't. It would have been... I would have, you know, I'm, I you have been homeless. Bones. You <laughs> no, <don't>. just kidding. <laughs> just Mommy kidding. can't make any money other, anymore. I have other sources of income, but I was like, I'm a single mom. I can't <laughs> shave the head. So I just added hair. And again, um, it was really kind of a shocking moment because I want to be clear. I have this, the San Diego friends who you met. Yeah. They were like, you're a mermaid. <laughs> They were like, put on anklets. You're so pretty. Oh, my God. This much hair is so pretty. Walk. Like, oh, it moves when you walk. They loved it because they maybe have bad taste at the core. And it's okay. But my New York friend who, mm-hmm. like, normally, she's very chic. She, like, wears the row. She works at Tory Burch. Mm-hmm. She just dropped that on me yesterday. And she was like, we were all being nice. And I was like, well, I want to tell you something. My San Diego friends weren't being nice. <laughs> they believed the dream. They were right there with me. But I'm really glad you're here and I live in New York City. And that, like, I have women like you in my life because otherwise, Lord only knows. I do have to say, if I'm not getting, like, gentle, honest bullied by my friends, mm-hmm. I don't trust them. If oh, you're yeah. too nice to me, I think you hate me. Oh, yeah. I'm like, do we have beef? Because you just complimented me. What do your friends um, call you out on? Oh, everything. Mm. I mean, I'm famous for not shaving my legs. Like, my top leg is not shaven. Oh, yeah. I do that You're, too. like, very close to it, and she just, like, gagged. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I grew up as a tennis player. It's funny because I love all the stuff you write about your body. Because as an athlete, I had a very, like, different perspective on my mm. body. It was always, like, just the engine that I used. Oh, I'm jealous. That's, like, what I've had to learn. It's interesting, though. Like, my mom, who is so beautiful, she, like, made a purpose to never tell me I was beautiful. Mm. And it was always... But it was other things that were attached to my ego. Am I smart? Am I kind? Am I winning all my tennis matches? So the same way you might be like, I'm ugly today. I'm worthless. I'd be like, I lost my tennis match today. Why should someone love me? Wow. So we're dealing with different battles out in these streets. So what should a mother do? What should one say? I'm, I'm like, I've been trying to figure that one out. Oh so God. we've, I've realized that we're, you try to like undo the generational trauma that's happened to you. And sometimes you will like overdo it. And I'm the first one I go, I don't want to tell girls they're pretty when they're younger. And the second a little cute toddler comes in, I go, you look so pretty. And I'm like, damn it. Mm. <laughs> but I just, I'm such a believer in like the words you tell young girls really 
tell the story they're going to tell themselves of who they are and like for to have more women in STEM and more athletes and that kind of stuff. It's just because people didn't tell them they could. Yeah. So I kind of want to see where if I have a daughter, she naturally gravitates for mm -hmm. and not like force her into anything and then kind of care less about results of like, are you beautiful and more like, how do you feel in your skin? Mm -hmm. Totally. No, I mean, when I'm, it's just funny because I wrote about it in the book and like my mom talking about beauty. And even when I was like a little baby, kind of having this narrative around it that felt really um, important in, in my household. And um, then I had my son and I'm called, I like have to, I, it's so hard for me not to call him beautiful all the time because I love him mm -hmm. and I look at his face and, you know, I do think it would be different culturally, whatever else, but I understand the instinct and the impulse to just compliment your child on the way they look. I know. It and sounds it's fucked up to yeah. be like, don't tell them they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. But what's hard is when you are beautiful, society responds differently to you. And like when I would win or when I'm funny, people like me more. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to not become obsessed with it right if you continually get it's like a dog that keeps getting pet when he does something we're gonna keep leaning into it and that's what laughs are for you just like a stroking of a it is my heroine <laughs> how did you get into high. comedy like were you the little girl who was like doing performances at school i'm just trying to picture you i was like definitely 12. raising my hand way too much in class mm -hmm. trying to be the class clown but i early on at like eight years old my dad was like a obsessed with sports and i was pretty athletic and I immediately I think because I was had I was hyperactive they put me into sports and I would just I chose tennis and by like 12 years old I was ranked like top 15 in the nation oh my god and it was the kind of thing where like that's what I am I am a tennis player and mm -hmm. at a young age I was like I want to be a professional tennis player wow and I like to tell this story because like obviously I'm sitting here and I'm not a professional tennis player and I ended up playing you know number one for the University of Wisconsin but I didn't love it. And I really just wanted to make my parents and my coaches, like I wanted to prove to them that I was great. But I actually just wanted to be a goofy little silly goose. But instead I was out there every day just like competing and pushing myself. And at 22, when I quit, I was like, why did you waste 15 years of your life? And now you have nothing. But you didn't have nothing, obviously. I mean, were you, you had developed a personality, you were you've come this far. It's not like you were behind. I guess when I was like 23, mm -hmm. I was like doing cold call sales mm -hmm. and, you know, not making that much money living with my parents. And I saw my friends who had played tennis, like traveling to France and Tokyo and playing internationally. And I could have, but I was like, this isn't what's meant for you. And I had some depressive years of just feeling like empty. That's a huge decision to walk away from something that you've invested basically your whole childhood and adolescence into just because you're like, this doesn't make me happy. Were your parents supportive? Yeah, but mm -hmm. it took me, it's like a relationship, you know, when you first get a red flag and then it takes you like seven years to be like, let's get out of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it goes back to you, how you were talking about kind of like how you might want to do comedy. It's like, we're so trained to that women can't be like multifaceted people. And I was like, I'm the athlete. That's why people love me. I'm Hannah, the great tennis player. So when I wasn't, I was like, then who am I? Mm -hmm. A lot of former athletes deal with this. Um, but then I realized like what, what made me good at tennis is also what makes me good at comedy. And stand-up comedy is actually very similar to tennis. Okay. This is an ESPN podcast, if you guys didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but that you're out there alone performing with these variables there's the crowd you're traveling and you have to have confidence in yourself when sometimes other people don't interesting wow I mean also you really like I was talking about earlier in your show you really engage with the audience and they like you kind of bounce the ball back and forth if you know exactly if you're, if you're following exactly. my yeah that's really like Charles Barkley and I'm Shaq oh I love that <laughs> oh, let's let's keep it going um so how did you start then like picking yourself out of this depression and going like, okay, I'm, because all the time I feel like you hear people say things like, I want to be a director. I want to be a yes. comedian. I want to be a whatever. And you're like, okay, like, how are you going to do that? Everybody wants to be a comedian. I don't want to sound too LA, but manifesting is so fucking real. That's very LA, but it's okay. I was so LA. I'm going to pull out a crystal from my pussy. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think there's different ways of manifesting. At the end of my senior year of college, I said that I wanted to do sports broadcasting 
And if you go on YouTube, Hannah Burner, Wisconsin, I was like out there doing these little broadcasts. And it was like kind of like an internship. But I felt alive and I loved it. But I'm from New York City. And I was like, I don't want to go to a small market. I want to go back to my family. 25 years old, I was miserable. I was like selling t-shirts. I don't even know what I was doing. And I saw one of those videos and I was like, I want to be on video. That's all. I just said, I want to be on camera. That's all I manifested. And then I started telling people about it. And someone was like, hey, there's a video production gig. I actually took an unpaid internship at 25. And that's when your friends are like, are you good, girl? Mm -hmm. But you have a long-term vision. Mm -hmm. You see something they don't see. And you just have to let it pass you. So I started making like funny tweets and memes and videos for this media company. And it was like a joke writing boot camp and bringing men back into our lives. Unfortunately, I dated a stand-up comedian and he subconsciously taught me a lot of things. Subconsciously? Like I wasn't wanting to be a stand-up at the time, um, but it was almost like when I was giving blowjobs, his semen was just like giving me his talent. Um, sorry, that was dark. That was Traveling too much into for the your corporate soul crowd. and permeating yeah. <laughs> your identity. Permanently. It was like Space Jam when they took the talent. Um, mm. <laughs> you sucked it out of him. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> Got it. Okay. But I just... Unexpected turn. <laughs> I have to be honest. I was, I was ready for you to tell me about your first night at the cellar or something else. And that's where we went. Girlies, I'm with you. can be fun sometimes. I'm with you. You can literally <laughs> suck talent out of men, it turns out. You're hearing it here first. Gen Z, are you listening? <laughs> Here's a successful 30-year-old comedian. <laughs> The men are like, actually, I don't want blowjobs anymore. Um, <laughs> like, we're good. But I saw his life where, like, he was performing at night. He was doing acting. He was doing podcasts during the day. And I'm like, you can make money just being yourself. Mm. And I grew up in New York where, like, all my friends were funny. We're all ball, ball busted. So mm -hmm. I never thought, like, I'm the funniest. But I knew that I making people laugh. Laughter was the one thing I always had in my life. No matter what horrible things were happening— Laughter was always there. I could always find something to smile about. And I didn't have tennis. You can win and lose. Jobs, you lose money. You can always smile and have a funny perspective on life. And I'm, I also love, this is going to sound like a TED Talk, but I love like disrupting male-dominated spaces. Mm. So like tennis, I, when I trained, it was all men around me. Um, so I kind of got used to being like, I can, I can play with these guys and I can show that like there's space for women here. Yeah. So stand up, there'd be so many more female stand ups if it was less of a boys club and easier to like go to open mics. And I was like, I'll be that bitch going into this male space. And I kind of, I do kind of get off on showing them like I can play too. Mm -hmm. But then I feel like your humor is not at all trying to like make the boys laugh. Just, I, I remember oh, no, you said to that. me, yeah, after the set, you were like, I just pretend I'm at brunch with my friends. Yeah. And I was like, you really, that really resonated. It was very clear. So you're going to these spaces where there's all these guys mm -hmm. where you, did you feel like you have to appeal to the male dominated comedy industry? Or were you like, fuck it, where are my girls in the audience? I'm going to make them laugh. The, great question. The male dominated industry, like at the end of the day, if you're funny, you're funny. And it is hard to go in front of just a ton of men and for them to laugh. But like, my best friend is my dad. Like, I love hanging out with guys. And I, I, I like to poke fun at them in a way that they don't expect. And I also like to feel like it's a female locker room. Like, there's men in the crowd now, unfortunately. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I like them to let them in mm -hmm. and see, like, girls are gross and silly and funny. And you're welcome. And it almost... It's like educational. Instead of just saying fuck men, it's like this is actually what we like to joke about. And like you could be in on the joke if you want. You're like, I'm changing the world by talking about queefing. <laughs> and I'm healing sexism and the patriarchy by my discussions around tampons and queefing. Well, I also feel like back in the day, like female comics, like they purposely would dress kind of ugly and be like, I'm just like the ugly, silly friend. Mm -hmm. So I almost yes. wanted to encapsulate, like I can be confident and feel sexy on stage while also talking about how often I queef and then just hold it. And for people to be like, holy shit, like you can be multifaceted. Right. And I feel like that with your career too, where people assume like you are just this one kind of some model girl mm -hmm. and we're so much more than that. Well, I think it's something you do in your early 20s, especially where you're like, you don't know who the fuck you are. You cannot believe that people consider you an adult. And you're <laughs> like, how am I, you know, you're trying to figure out how you're going to make any money because, you know, you know that the world is different than your parents and how they bought their house and whatever. And, you know, you try to like, 
box yourself into these things. And I'm sure that's what you experienced with tennis. But I had the same sort of moment where like at a certain point I was like, I'm not fucking happy and I just can't do it. And you just kind of, you it's not because you think people are going to like it. You just go for it, right? And you start being yourself and then hope for the best. I hate to say it, but it has to get like super dark sometimes for you to just be like, I can't betray myself anymore. Mm-hmm. I like to call it like a self-betrayal of you doing something you don't want. Because, like, I can't do the nine to five, and that's just me. But I tried it. I really tried. Very Gen Z of you. <laughs> I know. I'm so Again, Gen Z. she identifies as Gen Z, <laughs> and she also follows through. It's true. Yeah. But I, I also feel like you, with careers, you can force only so much. And people are like, how do you get the balls to do what you do? It's so risky. And I'm like, no, it's risky for me to not do this because mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to run away from depression. Which you is talk dark. about mental health a lot, which is like not something that. I feel like comedy people do that like later once they've made it. And then they're like, <laughs> actually, I almost killed myself. And you're like, you're doing what? this too early in your career. <laughs> no, no, I like it because it feels really seamless and authentic in a way that sometimes it doesn't when like people choose a cause. True. Oh, you're so You know what right. I mean? Like once they start getting a lot of hate online, they're like, actually, I'm a bully because I have anxiety. <laughs> totally. And they're like, and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you, why is that important to you? And like, how do you integrate that into what you're doing? Great question. I think I'm a very type A individual where growing up, it's like if you're successful, people love you more. And I always want people to think like I'm awesome and look up to me. And then I realize like (laughs) the people I look up to, they're not perfect. And just because you have money or you have success or you have a family doesn't mean you have it all. So I kind of like to make one person feel less alone if they ever look at me and say like she's living this, you know, perfect life. She's chasing her dream and be like, Someone messaged me once, like, how does it feel like to have it all? A very successful person said that to me. Wow. And I was like, you mean anxiety and depression? (laughs) And you start realizing, like, things happen to you. I know when you get more fame, people treat you differently. But it all matters just how you treat yourself. If you Mm. talk to yourself and treat yourself like shit, it doesn't matter what's happening externally. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way? Oh, my God. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's a lifelong journey. I had therapy today. Are you a therapy girly? I am. Okay. I used to go twice a week. Mm -hmm. Liz is her name. She's actually around our age. I don't know her exactly. Love her, Liz. (laughs) She actually really um, got me through a lot. My mom was very sick at one point. Um, Divorce. Uh, I wrote a book kind of like out of a lot of the conversations we had. She encouraged me to start writing. So like, shout out, Liz. Um, and yeah, I, I had a week of bad self-talk and it was like, it's so frustrating to kind of feel that, you know, this, what the mental health thing that I've heard and I really like is like, it's not just this like straight line or even windy road. It's like you go in in circles and you come back around and then you find yourself, you know, pulling yourself out. But it's really frustrating for me sometimes because I feel like I'm a mom. I have had, I've done a lot of the things that I kind of wanted to do in my life. And then I still find myself talking to myself like I'm 15 or like I'm 21. And that really, I get, then it adds this negative self-talk because I'm then like mad at myself for having those thoughts. Yeah. Then you're double down. So I'm self-talking on negative (laughs) self-talking on the negative self-talking and it's, it's just such a mess. Once I heard that Mm. like the voices in your head are not you, Mm -hmm. that blew my mind. Like it's like, a coach that might have been mean to you, something your mom might have said accidentally that really hurt you. And those voices, you don't have to trust them. And once I decided that I could choose to be nice to myself, the whole world changed for me. What about with fame though and TikTok? I mean, I feel like you obviously have so many followers and so much attention. And with that comes like negative comments. Mm -hmm. How do you handle those? So I, because I have a husband who's like lived some life, who has dealt with fame on his in his situation, he basically was like, you you can't be in the comments anymore. Like there's a certain time in your career where it's fun and everyone's enjoying it. And then comments just hurt my creativity. And I like to call it emotional cutting. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Liz gave me that one as Does well. Does Liz talk about that? Yeah, she was like, if you Google yourself, that's cutting. Yeah. So I haven't Googled myself in like a year. Wow. But I wish I could say the same. <laughs> no, I'm not just saying it. <laughs> it was for... like the Met was last week. Okay. I, know. I Googled myself. <laughs> well, I also feel like I had to get to some like dark places to yeah. know like I just don't fuck with that right. anymore. You and also like a very low. Yeah, yeah. It's ego related where you can't trust like when people love you too much and you can't trust when they hate you too much because they don't actually know who you are at all. Mm-hmm. 
I know. I heard you take a big breath there. No, I mean, it's so true. It kind of goes back to what you were saying about your parents and um, like accomplishing things as a form of love and like what, what your output is, is how much you deserve love. Yeah. And then if you do that on a scale of the internet and fame, it can be really dangerous. Especially game. when I'm trying to come up with the next funny video. If in my head, I'm thinking what user 72 said and I feel like I'm actually not going to post it. That just hurts me. Yeah. So I... Every now and then I get cocky and I'm like in the comments. And for people who are like, oh, I don't have millions of TikTok followers, we're all going viral nowadays. So everyone's mm. experienced that video that goes viral. And the next thing you know, you're like, why are they turning on me? I didn't do anything to anyone. I don't like this. Mm -hmm. But I do think once you realize it's like a car crash, you can stop and watch it. But you also don't have to. And once I realized you don't have to watch the car crash, I was like, it gave me power. And I, I want to be long term in this industry. And I'm a sensitive little bitch. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel everything. So I know some people might be tougher in that way. But in my way, like, what's the pro of reading comments to see people, if I got any compliments? Right. No, I just want to, if one person, this is, I'm not Mother Teresa, but like, if my video made like one person laugh or feel relatable, I'm like, cool. I feel like I so did my purpose. So should we move on to horoscopes now? Or no, I was kidding. waiting. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, that's such, that's wonderful advice. And it's so true. Um, and I do think that I used to kind of hate when celebrities or public figures would like talk about fame, but it's just now everyone is experiencing it. Like we truly are in Andy Warhol's future where like 15 minutes of fame, everyone gets it. And yeah, they love you and then they hate you and then they love you and then they hate you. And you cannot um, base your life on the perceptions of other people. I also feel like it's it's so cool being here with you because you are really kind of a cultural symbol for especially girls my age, younger girls, just women in general and to men. But you've you've become so much of like a like who you really are. People just don't know. Like you just symbolize something to people, and you become like a product. And as I've gotten like more attention, I realize like, oh, people don't care who you are. They just want the product. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people just see you as, yeah, they're just reflecting and projecting their own experiences onto you. Wait, you have to explain that a little bit more. Like, what would you say your product is? Because for me, it's like very easy, right? Like commodifying my image and my yeah. body as a model. But like you're doing comedy, yeah. which does feel so attached to your personality. I'm a clown. I'm a jester. Uh -huh. <laughs> I do think like sometimes people will see me in the street and, you know, like I'm like, you know, talking to my mom about something and like they see me and I think they immediately want me to like make them laugh or like do a joke. And like I am actually pretty similar on and off stage, I, I like to think. Um, but it's funny to see people just they always want <laughs> you're like dance monkey dance yeah, literally it's always like you're that. like I'm not I'm on and I want to bring joy to people yeah. but I'll be like picking my nose like mm. at the subway stop and I I'm really I put I'm performing for you and then there's like the Hannah who's like I'm just sitting here worrying about you know what I could possibly do wrong in my future right <laughs> right I mean so what you're saying is it's the comedy people are like be funny it's it's a lot of the comedy and mm. but I mean it's it's amazing and so cool, but it's interesting how like people do see you as, you know, the product on their FYP mm -hmm. and they don't realize like people are, again, as some, com some comedy girl <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> to bring it full circle, <laughs> but some I, comedy girl. You're so right. But it took me so much time to, to be called a comedian mm -hmm. and it means the world to me. What were people calling you before? Okay. I'm <laughs> well, sorry. Before, I have to understand. Oh no, before I was I was a tennis player. Right. I've also mm -hmm. I've done reality TV. Mm -hmm. I've done a ton of just like stupid videos online. Um and it, which I feel like the stupid videos are genius though. I mean, some of the first stuff I saw of you was not your stand up. It was you interviewing people, asking guys like, what were some of the questions <laughs> that I love? Like about periods or about mm -hmm. like where is the like scary stuff or has a woman ever faked an orgasm with you? I like to talk about pooping. I like uh -huh. to talk about farting. I feel like I have this, it's a superpower and kind of cringy, but that I, it takes a lot for me to be embarrassed. Like I'll take the risk <laughs> and I kind of like, man, that's me. I'm silly. I'm a silly goose. And I think with that, I want to say things that like maybe some girls are afraid to say. Mm -hmm. And cause like, yeah, I farted on men going down on me before. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've like had horrible poop situations. Um, I have a nervous poop problem and I'm saying that obviously it's embarrassing for me, but like who knows who's listening to this pod. Who's like, wait, I'm not gross. 
Because you're not. Right. Well, and also it's it's fucking funny. Wait, so Emrata, do you poop? I do poop. I also have a nervous pooping situation, actually. Um, <laughs> what's the what's the thing on TikTok where it's like, it, you're a hot girl if you have IBS, right? Yeah. yeah which, so <laughs> I, that has been, Gen Z has affirmed that for me. That's yeah. when I learned that I was a hot girl was when um, <laughs> I saw a TikTok that said hot girls have IBS. Every time like, we feel a bowel coming on. I was like, this is on. my generation. <laughs> I was like, that's right. Woo. Club tonight, feeling good. No, but seriously, they they're so much better about that kind of like self deprecating honesty Mm -hmm. that I think comes out of like you know a reaction to what we grew up with as millennials, which is like oversaturated, overfiltered, everything's perfect, tiny little seconds of everything. And you know they were like, no, 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 no. I immediately know how to see through that. We grew up with the internet, whatever. This is Gen Z, and they're just interested in like honesty and it's like I'm so glad that TikTok exists and isn't it actually like super attractive when someone is just like super comfortable and honest with who they are like I think that's so much more attractive than someone who you can tell is like trying to be something they're not yes or just you know the aspirational thing it's like it's just not real I also feel like how are we going to fight the patriarchy if we have to run to Starbucks every time we have to poop like it's just there's no competition wait so are we supposed to poop on the street no, we have to poop in his apartment, like while he's there. Got door it, open got it. I was like, so where, which level are we going to <laughs> right away? Or I just want the girls like mm. to not be nervous about things that, like, for example, I don't always shave my legs and mm. stuff. And I feel like, how are we going to compete with dudes who like don't have to worry about that stuff? And we're always worrying about it. Obviously, I do like my legs shaven and stuff like that. Yeah. But I guess I, now I have this voice and girls are listening to me and mm. I try to think what I would say to the insecure girl growing up who thinks she has to be perfect in so many ways. No, this podcast has a like very young female um, listenership and it's been really interesting because we get people sending in voice notes and then just like people come up to me on the street in New York and will ask me about like sex and dating <laughs> in, in a way that totally nobody would have done that to M. Rada before. You know yeah. what I mean? It was different. And they listened to the podcast and like we did an episode about sex on the first date and so many girls were just like, I just like, like I would, ne- I could never get an orgasm from sex on the first date, and I was like, "Yes, that is very, oh, that is we've normal, you know." But like nobody talked about that before. It was like you have to like sex. You have to like even when the boys aren't delivering, you know. So or now you just at least the girl, all your friends are coming all the time, yeah. and you just like haven't met the right guy yet. I have to say, I do have some friends who I'm like, what the f- what's going on down there? <laughs> They're like, well, I, of course, in the first five minutes, and I'm like, who are you? I'm like, what do you do and how? Because what the fuck? No, I'm calling their asses out right now. I'm like, you are a detriment to fem- feminism. But do you agree with orgasms that like either happens in the first five minutes or like seven business days? Like it's... <laughs> yeah, I go, I go seven business days. Yeah. Pretty much just like a huge, that's like the norm. And some girls I think are more confident easy with it where sometimes like yeah I need to have like the moon and Jupiter Mm -hmm. I need like the pillow has to be the perfect temperature (laughs) oh my god yeah and then if it goes on too long then you start thinking about why is it going on so long it's like a whole and then we're faking it (laughs) yeah but it's I just think that it's so important for women like the pooping is leading to safer sex better sex like you know the conversations about that kind of stuff that are kind of like haha funny we women should be able to be gross it also leads to like real life protection which is so important and I I think that's the part of it that like maybe people don't always understand like if you're interviewing women on the street about you know how many times they faked an orgasm like you're opening up a conversation that will lead to more fulfilling relationships in general and like happier children and like a better society Mm -hmm. and maybe not everybody sees that right away but like I think that's the beautiful thing about comedy and again why I'm going to start doing Um, (laughs) stand-up no I'm I'm kidding this is it I'm Seeking help. Netflix. Seeking help. Um, <laughs> Sony. I'm like, uh huh. Sony, Netflix. I'd like that um, stand up deal right now. Um, no, but I do think um, it's the amazing thing about comedy is like you can make people laugh and then deliver really like important messages, which is beautiful. I'm going to cry because this is such a great full circle moment of you just like bantering with Julia about comedy yeah but I do think like comedy is a silly way to sneak in real things like I talk about dark shit mm-hmm. but it's not as scary because there's like fart jokes in between I was like just really impressed by the community you've built and on virtually and but also it's really impressive to be able to do that in real life thank so you. congratulations on everything and thank you for doing this oh. I really appreciate it um and yeah first live show it was an honor to be here thanks for having me thanks so much for being here
Yay. So much fun. So much fun. 